All right, AP Literature friends. So Christian Kuhn here for another writing workshop, affectionately known as the Bob Ross of Composition. Going to bring you in this writing workshop, FRQ2 from the 2023 exam, Nisi Shaw's Everfair. So this was released the other day. And I know that uh, a lot of teachers in the Facebook groups were talking about how difficult and challenging this was for students. And I agree, if students were not well versed in how to perform deep, tight syntactical reads, they're going to struggle with this one a little bit. And I'll walk you through how uh, my students wrote it and how I teach them to write it. And by the end of the video, hopefully you get a full sense of how your students can pull the strings of my templates and cobble this essay together in the future for test prep uh, purposes. So let's take a look at the prompt. It says, the following excerpt is from Nisi Shaw's novel Everfair, published in 2016. In the passage, the narrator describes the experience of a young woman, Lizette, as she rides her bicycle through the French countryside in July 1889. Read the passage carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how Shaw uses literary elements and techniques to portray Lizette's complex response to her experience of riding her bicycle. So when I read this, I was reminded of a Diane Ackerman piece in which she describes a bike ride through uh, Cooperstown, New York, around Glimmerglass Lake. And I've actually used that piece to, I think it's called On, on Tender Thread or something of that nature. Uh, it's basically one huge block paragraph, run-on sentence, and the syntax mirrors the effort, the exertion of the excursion around the lake. And Shaw's piece does basically the same thing as Diane Ackerman's. Unfortunately, I did not use uh, Diane Ackerman's piece this year. I have used it in the past. Otherwise, that would have been, you know, a good, you know, good piece of fodder in order to tackle this. So that's the prompt. Pretty standard fare. So our next question is this. How do I write the introductory paragraph? And for those of you that are familiar with my work, you know that I have two templates, the declarative and the inverted thesis, to help students house their thesis in the introductory paragraph. And one thing that I always tell students, especially taking the AP Lit Exam, is that all of the FRQs on the Lit Exam, you can invert the thesis. So what I'm gonna do for simplicity's sake is exclusively show in this writing workshop how to invert the thesis. I find that if if it's you know a struggling and emerging writer, if I give them carte blanche to declare, they're going to get out of the expository mode and end up writing plot synopsis or plot summary, plot analysis. And we know we can't do that. This is straight up nuts and bolts literary analysis. So to guarantee the thesis and the fact that the student is meeting the demands of the assignment, I go inverted. So what I'll do is I have three examples, three models that students wrote that will demonstrate how to manipulate this inverted template. One of the things I always talk about in all of my writing workshops, and especially when I work with teachers in, the, in my National Writing Project courses, is the following idea. It's my adage. You got to Bob Ross your composition. So what you're doing, what you're going to do in this, what you're going to see in this, in this demonstration here is students that have worked with me since the day after Labor Day all the way to the exam. And what you're going to do is see how students write come exam day in May after having me for a full year running through my Word Study Academy, my Nuance Academy, and me Bob Rossing my instruction uh, from day one. And what I mean by that is, I position myself as the expert writer in the classroom. I get to the proverbial easel in Canvas, and I model, model, model with my students how to pull the strings of my templates until they are independent and can do it on their own. So here's a little cheat code that uh, I, I like to tell students about and teachers about. It's kind of like a little hack of the, of the exam. If you break down FRQ1 and FRQ2, the language of the prompts, even going back to like the 1970s on these, implicit in every prompt are two questions. The first is, 
what is the author's intent or what is the authorial intent? Some people talk about universal truth, universal theme, the exigence. I call it authorial intent. And the second question is, how does the author construct meaning? If students can ascertain a correct read of the passage and answer these two questions, 100% guaranteed that they're going to get the thesis point. And then if they can wield some compositional nuance, they're going to score pretty well on this. So those are the two questions. What is the author's intent and how does the author construct meaning? In terms of doing the inverted thesis, here's what I have my students do. I have them take three sentences to craft what is the author's intent. So three sentences to answer that question, what is the author's intent? And then one sentence, how does the author construct meaning? So let's look at that graphically here. I always tell my students it's kind of like an upside down triangle when you invert the thesis. So the first three sentences are going to be the context and background. What is the author's intent? What is the universal theme? What's the truthiness of the passage? And you don't want to start with hooks and analogies and things like that. There's no need to be cutesy in this. It's a straight up academic paper. So three sentences for authorial intent, and then you end with the thesis. Whenever you answer the question, how does the author construct meaning, you're dropping your terms, your devices, your techniques, and that constitutes or comprises the thesis statement. So you end with the thesis, one sentence construction of meaning. Now, there's other components that go into the introductory paragraph because I want my students out of the gate going for the unicorn point, the sophistication point. So I always have my students write four sentences for their introductory paragraphs. I find those one sentence baggers, they totally lack sophistication. I think it's really hard to get, a, get the sophistication point if you're not doing some straight up nuts and bolts, good compositional strategies here. And I know having taught college for at the college level for over 20 years, I would not accept a one sentence introduction from a college student. And we got to keep in mind the college board, they used to say this. I don't know if they do it anymore, but they used to say come exam time that a student needs to read, write, think, and speak like a college sophomore English major. So I want my students approximating good college writing. So four sentences is, is, is a good length for the introductory paragraph. So I want my students also to cop a certain academic tone. I refer to that as tier two level vocabulary. I run a word study academy throughout the duration of my academic year where I give students a lot of tier two level exercises to augment their vocabs. So you're going to see my students wield some basic, you know, good SAT level caliber words in their writing. But they stay in their wheelhouse, they stay in their lane, they don't sound contrived or pretentious, but they sound like their academic best. Now the other thing that I do in my classroom, and I do this with my National Writing Project courses as well, is teach my students uh, a variety of sentence constructs to achieve voice rhythm and flow. I borrow heavily from a concept called rule number 18, and that's featured in Strunk and White's seminal text called Write It Right. In that, they espouse the idea that there's 12 different ways to cobble together a single sentence. So my students are well-versed in sentence constructs, which actually help them to read this passage, but you'll see them wield a variety of sentence constructs to get that rhythm flow voice going. And as I've already alluded to, it is four sentences long. So the math, right? Let's break this down again. Three plus one equals the intro. So we want to see three sentences, authorial intent, and then one sentence, construction of meaning. So let's take a look at exemplar number one. So this is one of my better writers that uh, executed this one, and they, they do a nice job of manipulating the three plus one paradigm. So check this out. Nothing like the bicycle speaks about the freedom and humanity of being carefree and young. This incredible mechanical friend allows one to explore, to reach unthinkable places. It is by riding a bicycle that one can learn the life pulse of a particular setting best, since one has to sweat up the hills and coast down them, therefore taking in 
all the beautiful minutia of the journey. So I think that nicely expresses like the thematic exigence of the piece. And in this last sentence, we have to highlight, accentuate the key terms, devices, techniques that Shaul uses. And in this one, all of my students did, you know, the, the ones that read it well, uh, focus on the syntactical manipulations within the piece. So all of the thesis statements that we're going to see uh, in this writing workshop focus on syntax and some of them hinge it on one more. So I just tell my students, don't make it a literary terms dumping ground. You, do, you don't want to dump a whole bunch of terms in here. So two at most three. So the last sentence gets to the construction of meaning. In Shaw's homage to Lizette's excursion and the bicycle itself, she captures these sentiments through a wide array of syntactical arrangements and physical descriptors. So that's really good. So the idea that there's a ton of adjective use in this, uh, kind of a characterization of the journey, the excursion itself. So look at the vocab in this. Take a look at the sentence constructs. I like the use of that double dash in the uh, in the last sentence. Students need to be able to do that kind of stuff in order to be in contention for the sophistication point, I think. Students, just like Shaw, need to exercise a wide variety of syntactical flares and manipulations in order to be in contention for that unicorn point. So this one out of the gate is very solid. And I think any reader would say, wow, if this kid can sustain this for the duration of the paper, I'm absolutely going to give him or her the sophistication point. But it's a straight up nuts and bolts inverted thesis. There's no tricks to it. Three plus one. All right, let's take a look at that again. Let's do it all over again and take a look at student number two and what they've put together for us. So again, we're gonna go three plus one. The bicycle teaches what effort is, what it literally and figuratively means to reverse the veritable ups and downs of life. And I think a lot of students uh, in, in, in my class in particular did this. They connected that excursion, the journey to life itself as kind of an extended metaphor. It is not just about enduring the seemingly impossible mountain pass, but in the fortunes and sorrows of the entire journey. In many ways, cycling is a long travel in which one searches for the tr their true self. So we're at the, the uh, construction of meaning sentence again. So let's see where we go. Shaw captures this epic quest in her descriptive tribute to Lizette and her new mechanical friend. So you can also just have a thematic focus on the end if you want to and drop your lit terms, as we'll see in a second, in the first premise. There's a risk in doing that and having a thematic thesis. I'm afraid sometimes AP readers look at that and say, there's no terms mentioned, therefore there's no thesis. So there's great risk in that. But I think unquestionably this student articulated a thesis, uh, even though the, the lit terms are implied. I like it when they explicitly mention them because I know that readers get fatigued at the uh, you know re reading site. And if they don't have a pronounced term device technique thrown in their face, they might say, oopsies, no thesis statement. So this one does run a risk, but it is done right in the sense that it's three plus one. So hopefully fresh eyes would see that. All right, so I'm going to show you a third one. And yes, you can, students and teachers. This is pretty easy. Three plus one, keep the vocab up, focus on those sentence structures. So here's student number three. Many a wise man has equated the act of riding a bicycle to the very essence of traversing through life, all while keeping one's balance. The reality of both bike riding and living is simple. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. But above and beyond this, a solitary bicycle excursion is about doing things without needs, restraints, and the things of the world that unnaturally stifle a person. So that's three sentences of authorial intent. Now we're going to get one sentence of construction of meaning. Shaw, through her description of her protagonist and through her syntactical manipulations, captures the epic wonder of such a journey in this praising tribute to a mechanical friend. 
So this one's doing the same. You can see academic diction, good focus on that voice rhythm and flow. So one little trick that I tell my students is don't parallel your sentences, especially in the introduction. So you want to have, you know, supple, different, varied, syntactical arrangements in your sentences in order to achieve what I often refer to as voice rhythm and flow. All right, at this stage of the game, if you're running this in your classroom as an exercise, as a writing workshop, I'd pause the video and have students draft their own introductions to this. And then one good practice that I have is this. I, I, I think students learn best when they see writing. They need to see a lot of writing. So have some students volunteer to uh, project their uh, samples, their introductions on the overhead and critique them as a class and take a look at the good, the bad, the ugly of what students are doing. And then the big, big thing, teacher, you try your hand at it as well. Be the Bob Ross of composition, be the expert in the classroom and write a few of these for your, uh, for your students. All right, so we're at the end of drafting the introductory paragraph. So we beg the following question. So how do I write the body paragraphs? And for those of you that are familiar with my work, you know that I use something called the syllogistic method. Let me give a quick cursory overview of this. In my YouTube channel, you can do deeper dives into the history and kind of the philosophy behind the syllogistic method where I do explicit teaching on inductive and deductive reasoning. But for now, for this video, I'll just give you a working knowledge and a working understanding of what the syllogistic method is. So it's rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. Aristotle ran a school called the Lyceum and the town's boys would go there to learn about polemics, oration, debate, wordsmithing, word wrangling. And they would often throw out these juicy essential questions like what is justice? And the great philosophical minds and scholars would step to the proverbial mic and they would drop their definition of what justice is. And then the others would gather around and find all the all the you know holes in the logic. And Aristotle, like us, composition instructors, said, you know, why do some of my students absolutely crush their arguments? Why are they phenomenal orators? Some of my students are just kind of meh. And then I got some kids that just tank bomb the execution of their arguments. And one day he had a eureka moment and he said, aha, I got it. The students who really argue well really excellent with their polemics. They are very mathematical and computative in their execution of their reasoning. You know, we talk about line of reasoning all the time. It's very mathematical. It's very computative. And he said, I got it. The students who are excellent at this, they use the syllogistic method. And what that means is they argue from premise, premise, conclusion, just like a mathematical, logical formula. So if I were to say to you, Premise number one, arsenic is deadly. You nod your head and say, yeah, Christian, you're right. You're right. Arsenic is deadly. But then if I say premise number two, my dog ate arsenic, you know, your eyebrows might begin to furrow a little bit because you're going to draw the following conclusion, the following logical conclusion. Your dog's going to die, Christian, right? So that is a syllogism, bulletproof logic from top to bottom, staying supremely organized within the construct, within the syllogistic construct, and going from top to bottom. Now, oftentimes what students don't do is present all three parts of the equation. And if we were to go back and read sample papers that the college board puts out, Oftentimes, students only put forth the second premise in this particular FRQ, and that's why they read so plot heavy. So now let's talk about how do we take Aristotle's syllogistic method and turn it into a template or a heuristic for the purposes of performing literary analysis. So let's define the terms. The first premise is going to be an argument containing terms, devices, techniques. All right. And I always have my students take three sentences 
to write the first premise. And I'm going to model that for you in a second. On FRQ1 for the synthesis paper on uh, the AP language exam, the College Board states three times, your argument must be central. And I wish they would say that on all six FRQs, Lang and Lit combined, because we are arguing this is expository writing. So students need to be arguing with their terms, devices, techniques. Otherwise, they're not performing literary analysis. They're doing something else, probably plot synopsis. So we're going to take three sentences to ensure the centrality of our argument stays intact. Second premise is textual support. We're going to teeter-totter balance the quoting and the paraphrasing. And I'll show you a template within the template to make sure that students quote with absolute deliberation. So sometimes students quote, but it seems very disconnected and kind of willy-nilly. And then the conclusion of the body paragraph, and I really want to emphasize this, uh, body paragraphs need to be concluded as well as the textual analysis. And this is where we link echo and kind of keep the promise of our first premise. So we link an echo back to the prompt and throw it back to the thesis. So there's math to my template. Three sentences, first premise, and then a body paragraph for all of the FRQs on AP Lit and AP Lang should be 10 to 12 sentences long. I strongly contend that those students who write the four or five sentence bagger paragraphs are going to preclude themselves from getting the sophistication point. You cannot possibly achieve enough analysis and support in four or five sentences to fully flesh out an argument. So I think they need like 10 to 12 sentences. It helps keep things cogent, which is Aristotle's word, supremely logical, locked in. And uh, it's plenty of space to have a nicely developed argument. And uh, they can uh, go from top to bottom. So let's take a look at a first premise and see what I mean by that. So I have sentence stems that I like to equip my students with. And you can steal my very first four words and the comma right from the onset. You'll see my students say that pretty systematically in their essays or they'll have something closely akin to it right from the onset. I like that because students often ask, where do I begin my analysis? And I always say, begin where the author begins and go systematically, have a chronology, have a sequence in which you just methodically go through the piece and cross analyze when necessary. So when you say right from the onset, you're gonna begin where Shaw begins and work your way down through it. So let's see what this student did for these first three sentences here. And oftentimes my students will uh, have more than one literary term in the first premise. And that's a good practice because what you really don't want is one paragraph tone, one paragraph syntax, one paragraph diction, one paragraph metaphor, right? So that's too methodic. That's too dutiful. You're never going to get the sophistication point doing that. So I like to see my students multitask in the first premise and begin to combine terms, devices, techniques together in terms of constructing meaning. So let's look at this first premise. So they use the stem right from the onset. Shaw mirrors her syntax to the breathing fluctuations of the actual physical activity of cycling. So that was an observation that we made in going over this in the class. The syntax mirrors the breath. That's a great observation. All right. To match the effort and ease of the excursion, the author wields a variety of sentence constructs to reflect both the exertion and freedom of this one particular journey. So heavy focus on sentence constructs, syntax. In order to achieve this artistic effect, Shaw also takes great liberties in stacking adjectives and absolute phrases within Sisuras. And I like this. So there's a multi-layered focus on this. And the student has a lot to tackle in the remaining sentences. So this is fantastic. It's very active. There's many things that they're going to have to analyze. The adjectives, the absolute phrases, Sisuras, the syntax, the sentence constructs. So that's how we do first premises. And uh, this way, the, ki the kids are very ambitious and they can tackle many things at one time. So just a quick synopsis here. First premise, three sentences, 
It has to be a literary argument. So one of the things that I do after I write my first premise, just to sort of open up the lid of my brain, like how, how I Bob Ross this, I write the first premise and then I go quote hunting. I go look at my annotations. I go look at the text and I get all the quotes and paraphrases that I'm going to need in my second premise because you have to keep the promise of the first premise, right? That's a promise. We promised that we were going to analyze certain literary components within our body paragraph. So I need all the quotes and paraphrases to be absolutely germane and connected to my promise. All right. And that's the key thing. All right. Remember for line of reasoning, the promise of the first premise must be met. It must be static and stationary. So I have another sentence stem here. It's actually a sentence clause. My students begin the second premise with the word immediately. So it ties back to right from the onset. So we need a quote and or a paraphrase that ties with that right from the onset. And just to refresh our memory, we know that we were talking about the syntactical mirror between the breathing and the sentence constructs. So we need to quote and or paraphrase that if we're going to keep our line of reasoning intact. So look at where we go here. Usually uh, in, the, in the fourth sentence, my students begin to quote. So this is the transition into the second premise. Immediately, the focus is placed on the physical nature of the experience, and then that Lisette Tortenier sighed, and then in the following sentence, she breathed in again, out, in. All right, so we got some quotes here. We have to analyze this, right? You can't just quote dump, so it's a one, two, three punch. Quote, paraphrase, analyze. Without question, the protagonist's bicycle ride is arduous at times, as is it physically trying. In describing her progress along the forest path, Shaw likewise adds a certain degree of labor to her sentence constructs to reflect the relationship between Lizette and her machine. So do you see this teeter-totter balance, this all support analysis, quote, paraphrase. Don't do one far more at the expense of the other. As Lizette befriends her new bike, she acclimates herself to it, but the going isn't easy. To illustrate the tenuous relationship, uh, Shaw describes Lizette's progress and that of her new mechanical... Oh, sorry. At, sorry. Yeah, I, I screwed that up there. To illustrate the tenuous relationship, Shaw describes Lizette's progress and that of her new mechanical friend. At sentence level, the author takes liberty linking dependent clauses with commas, or instead, dependent clauses often stand alone as their own sentences. So this is something where like my nuance academy really paid off. My students picked up that there are a lot of really strange sentence constructs in here. And some even are grammatically incorrect. And you have to say, you know, Shaw's a professional writer. She knows better than to drop a dependent clause as a standalone sentence. Why is she doing this? Right. And great observation. But so what? It mirrors the breath. Right. And that's what we promised in the in the first premise. So that's what we're getting at. Artistically, Shaw takes these syntactical liberties for a number of reasons. First, Lizette's breath is documented and captured throughout the entire passage, but her wonder, excitement, fatigue, and innocence are also captured in these sentence arrangements. To reflect, reflect such an instance, Shaw has the following clause stand alone. Up on the creaking leather seat, right? So you see that stood alone as a sentence. That's a great observation. My students really picked up on a lot of cool stuff in this. Clearly, this is not a complete sentence, but to convey the wildness of the journey, Shaw likewise employs countless susuras and tells us things like that it was at first work. Um, each comma signifies a breath, a pause, physical exertion, and each run-on sentence illustrates Lizette's unfettered downhill movement. These are great observations to connect the syntax to the action. And this is everything that we promised in the first premise. So this is definitely keeping its line of reasoning intact. Further, Shaw drops simple standalone clauses to indicate setting transitions. For example, 
the long effect to get to, to the river is captured by the two-word sentence of the river, period. These terse sentences are spoken like statements of triumph, which Shaw punctuates with the frequent use of exclamatory sentences. So you can see here, that's plenty of textual support and analysis to keep the promise of the first premise. And, you know, all the quotes and or paraphrases are completely germane to what was spoken of in that first premise. So we promised a big uh, coverage of syntax, and that's what you got. But we're not done. You need to conclude the thought, right? You can't just end on a, on a quote, right? Oftentimes students do that. To conclude the thought, you need like one or two sentences just to wrap it around back to the thesis, back to the prompt, back to the promise of the first premise. So look at what this student did. You can do it in one sentence. Most students take two sentences. Uh, three is a little long, but sometimes students will take three. So you want to try to keep it around 10 to 12 sentences. It's okay if you go a little over, uh, but don't get, you know, super waylaid and go on and on and on because you'll probably invariably break your line of reasoning. So this is the conclusion of this body paragraph. The cool, warm, cool, warm fluctuation of Lizette's ride is captured with such syntactical flares. As Lizette goes, so go Schultz's sentence structures. This is a great way to wrap it up. I really, really like that a lot. So that was that was pretty tight, and the line of reasoning definitely stayed intact. And that's all key stuff you see there in terms of getting the sophistication point. So still, you focus on your tier two level vocab. You focus on your sentence constructs, silky smooth quote transitions, and absolutely bulletproof line of reasoning. So if you're doing this as a whole class, I would pause and have students work on their first premises and then go quote hunting and then do the rest. And, you know, teacher discretion here. Take a look at a few first premises. Uh, maybe you want to do like a chalk talk and put the quotes on the board next to the uh, first premises to make sure that everything's staying uh, germane and, uh, you know, logical and making sure that the quotes are linked to the promise of the first premise because that's kind of a sticky area for some students they don't know how to how to choose quotes with deliberation and i you know usually i have to bob ross the heck out of that in order to deliver that concept all right we're not done with the essay we have a question what do i do next and the answer is simple you're going to bust out another syllogism so here's what I mean by that. There's still a whole bunch of stuff we have left to analyze. Like we have that very poignant ending that we haven't even spoken of yet. So what you do is you reload the first premise, three sentences, switch up your terms, devices, techniques. There's still a whole slew of things that we still have to talk about. And we're probably at the middle of the passage and we got to work our way all the way to the end. So I reload that first premise, change my quotes, change my terms, 10 to 12 sentences, first premise, three sentences, right? So my students write four paragraphs for all FRQs, Lang and Lit. So intro, two bodies and a conclusion. And that's all you need. So I know some teachers are absolutely emphatic that uh, students need to write five paragraphs. They absolutely do not. I think if they're doing four or five sentence uh, body paragraphs, then yeah, you probably need uh, you know that third body paragraph, but you're gonna get ding-donged on your organizational points uh, in doing that. So four paragraphs, syllogistic body paragraphs, 10 to 12 sentences, so intro, two bodies, conclusion. All right, let's wrap this essay up. We need a conclusion on it. And for those that are familiar with my work, you know that my students are equipped with a whole bunch of sentence stems that I like to use to um, wrap things up with a thematic focus. So I don't think there's any magic bullet for conclusions. They're pretty standard fare. And my students, uh, you know, follow my recommendation and just end with a big thematic encapsulation of the piece. So you kind of end with the exigence again, the aha, the 
the you know come to Jesus moment of the passage and the author's intent. So one sentence stem that we use is in a global sense, and this student used it here. And I have uh, videos on conclusions in my YouTube channel if you want to take a deeper dive into this. But this is just one crack at it. It's very simple. My students take usually three sentences, no more than four to wrap things up. So take a look at this. In a global sense, art imitates life. Even the simple joys of a carefree, although arduous, bicycle jaunt can be captured at sentence level. So again, the essay really is, you have to analyze the syntax. You know, that's that was key for this. Further, as seen through the character of Lizette, a simple bike excursion can liberate the soul and forever forge a bond with the very thing that delivers the adventure and union. Right, so the idea that you had syntax, you have characterization, and the fact of that, you know, union between Lizette and her new bike. All right, we are at the end here. One of the things I always say to my teachers is this, happy teaching and happy writing. So I hope this served you well and you can use it in your classroom and it helps demystify things for you and your students as you test prep down the road or review the exam. So just to wrap things up, note that if you need to contact me with any questions or want any of my content, feel free to drop me an email at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. Also know that I'm a lead teacher for the National Writing Project, and this summer, every summer we do this, we have the AP English FRQ Boot Camp. So we have um, a course for AP Literature and a course for AP Lang. I've taught both courses for 21 years now. And what we do is an FRQ breakdown. We basically will demonstrate how to pull the strings of my template for each FRQ. So again, you declare or invert the thesis, and then you tackle body paragraphs syllogistically. So we'll go over all three FRQs together uh, during our summer course. And uh, there's information on my website at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com on that. So in looking things over, this is the most affordable AP training uh, in comparison to the others that are offered. And at the end of our time together, you will have absolutely a bulletproof way to teach the composition of the course. And I think that's one of the things that's really important in, in offering PD. You know, it's AP literature and composition and composition, AP language and composition. So it's important in these PDs to get the composition because that's, uh, you know, a big, big part of the course. So we also offer a slew of other courses through the National Writing Project. I do have a, a, a self-paced course in there for teachers that are, you know, slim on time. And uh, yeah, there's some free content on there as well that you can have access to. So that brings us to the end. Hopefully you are well. And again, happy teaching, happy writing.